All right, do you believe God wants you to, or wants to use you to make a difference in this world? Do you believe God wants to use you to make a difference? I know that we understand God wants to use Christians to make a difference in the world, but I've, sometimes I don't believe we believe God wants to use each of us individually to influence this world, to make a difference in this world. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are told this. It says, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God created us. We are His workmanship. We are His masterpieces, and He designed us to do good work. We hear that verse, but do we really believe that verse? We hear that verse, but have we really grabbed hold of that verse and lived it in our lives? I think sometimes we believe God only uses a select few people. For instance, we think you need to have a Bible college degree to be effective in in God's kingdom. That's what he prefers. Or or you need to be a person with, with charisma of some sort for God to be able to use you. Or maybe you need to be a go getter, a workaholic for God to be able to really, really use you in the kingdom. Sometimes we think, well, you need to have a lot of experience, years of experience, so that you can be used by God in his kingdom. But are those things really what God is looking for? I mean, I don't want you to get the impression that any of those things are bad. Those are all good things. Don't get me wrong. Uh, It's good to work and work hard for the Lord, but but are those the the attributes God is looking for? When, When he looks for servants, are these the attitudes that are essential for what he needs to happen in this world? There's a picture of a guy we're going to have up in the screen real quick. I'm probably going to say his name wrong. Wrong. His name is Nick Vujicic. Vujicic, I think, is how you say his name. Look that up, by the way. Go to YouTube, look up Nick Vujicic, or you can look up No Arms, No Legs, uh, No Worries, and you will find him. But, but he was born without arms, and he was born without legs. He has one little uh, foot thing on his left side. He calls it his little chicken wing. That's what he calls it. But, but he's, a, he's so powerful as an inspirational speaker. He speaks to all sorts of groups. He speaks to businesses. He speaks to kids. He speaks to everyone. And he tries to let them know that his limitations really aren't limitations unless he allows them to become limitations. And you see him in some of the videos. He's playing soccer. You see him in other places. He's swimming in the pool or diving off the high dive. And to be quite honest, he gives all the credit to God, to Jesus Christ. He's a committed Christian. I look at him and I wonder how we get to the point that we think that our weaknesses can keep us disqualified from being useful servants in the kingdom. I wonder sometimes why we believe that the weaknesses we have are so to such a degree that God really can't use us. What is it that God is really looking for in a servant? If you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, that's an Old Testament book, by the way. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Just the first part of this verse, I want you to listen to what God is looking for. What God wants in His servants. This is what He says. He says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Now I want you to think about what that verse says. That verse says God is looking all over the world, looking for people who are committed to him see that's the qualification to being a servant of the lord commitment to the lord now notice that god through his word says in that one verse he could continues to communicate to us because he says not only those that are committed to me what am i looking for but i'll strengthen them i'll work through them i'll accomplish great things in them because they're committed to me God has designed each and every one of us to be used in this world to make a difference, to do great things for Him. No matter who you are, if you give your life to the Lord, He has designed you to do great things for Him. Today we're going to start a new series of sermons. It's based on a book by Chip Ingram entitled Holy Ambition. Holy Ambition. 
I would encourage you to buy the book if you want. Uh, you have to get it off of Amazon. They'll get it to you in a few days, and, and you can read along. Uh, I'm not saying everything he says or anything like that. These are my take on what he talked about. But, but I want you to understand it's a powerful book, and it's based on the life of Nehemiah. And as you look at the man Nehemiah, you recognize what commitment really looks like. What, what living your life in order to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, really looks life, like. So in this series, to be quite honest, it's a series designed for everyone who wants to make a difference in the world. If you want to make a difference in the world, this is the series for you. These are the sermons that you need to hear. If you want to increase your commitment level to God, these are the sermons you need to hear. For all of you who don't want to do that, I, I'm sorry. That, that's what we're talking about. So hopefully we're off on you anyway. But that's what we're looking at for the next few weeks. We will learn how we can be the most useful tools in the hands of God, the, the tools that we've been designed to be. And in each of these sermons, we will look at a different characteristics that, that, that make us useful to God. But I want you to caution you, this is not a, a stair step, this is not a ladder, this is not a checklist of things that, that build on each other. These are all things that we need to constantly be working on, but we do need to start here on this characteristic this morning, which I'm going to let you in on here in just a minute. But if you would turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1, that's where we're going to be. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. As you turn there, let me just give you a little background. Israel is in captivity. Now, they're in captivity because of what? Because they are idol worshipers. They, they just don't want to worship God alone. They have to throw in all these other idols, and he's gotten sick of it, and he's allowed other people to come and take them over. So they're in trouble because they're idol worshipers. Uh, Assyria overthrew the north, and then 150 years later, Judah was overthrown as well, and Nehemiah is under Artaxerxes, the ruler, who's been ruling for about 20 years when we get to this text. This is what it says. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Hananiah, one of the, my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province uh, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What made Nehemiah so effective in the hands of the Lord? What made Nehemiah so effective in the hands of the Lord is that Nehemiah had developed a dislocated heart. Nehemiah had developed a dislocated heart. Now, I know we're going to have to explain that. So let's take a moment and, and see what dislocated heart really means, at least in the context of this sermon. Uh, most of the time you hear about dislocated things, dislocated shoulders, dislocated fingers or knees or whatever, and you think, I want nothing to do with that. But a dislocated heart is something you need to grab hold of. Now for most of us, what are our hearts usually focused on? For most of us, our hearts are focused on ourselves, on our issues, on our struggles, on our circumstances, on the problems that we're involved in. Our hearts are focused on us, our family, our retirement, our hobbies, all the things that relate to us. For the most part, that's what most people's hearts are focused on. A dislocated heart, however, is completely different. Instead of being focused on self, a dislocated heart is touched by the issues of others. It is moved by the plight that others are going through. A dislocated heart has taken the eyes off of self and placed them on someone else. Now let's look back at Nehemiah here for a moment. Nehemiah is what we call a food tester. Now, back in Nehemiah's day, all the rulers of the day were worried. They were worried someone was going to try to kill them so they could take their throne, take their, their uh, kingdoms from them. One of the ways in which that happened quite often was that they were poisoned. Someone put poison in their food. And so all the kings, all the royal people would have a food tester. Someone who ate the food before they ate the food. And they'd wait enough amount of time and say, uh, yep, they didn't fall over dead. I think the food's good to eat. And so they'd go ahead and eat it. Now, Nehemiah was that guy. 
the interesting thing about that is you would think that's a pretty bad job. I've got to eat the food and see if it's poison. But the truth is, as long as the food was good, you were good because you lived in the palace. Nehemiah had like a condo in the palace. He was right there. He enjoyed everything the king enjoyed. Not only did he enjoy everything the king enjoyed, but lots of times the food testers became good friends with the kings because they were always with the king. And that's what Nehemiah had done. He had built this great relationship with the king. He had the ear of the commander, of the ruler of his, of his area there. And as long as the food wasn't poison, Nehemiah was good. He was living the good life. Now you've got to understand that because of what happens next. He's living the good life, as good as it gets. And look at his reaction when he hears about the remnant of God's people struggling and in disgrace. When he hears this news, what does Nehemiah do? He weeps and he mourns and he fasts and he prays. His heart was no longer focused on the life that he had. Instead, his heart was touched and even broken by the situation that his brothers were going through. How touched are you by the circumstances of those around you? I mean, really, how touched are you by the struggles that people are involved in, even the struggles of the church itself? Chip Ingram gives some statistics that he claims decide, or, uh, reveals the spiritual sickness of the church, but he says this, he says, 53% of church leaders don't believe in absolutes anymore. 33% of church leaders deny that Jesus physically rose from the dead. Divorce, premarital sex, and stealing are the same among Christians as among non-Christians. Half of all churches have no one who come uh, to a saving relationship with Jesus in the past year. 80% of churches have either plateaued or are declining. Eight, eight to ten churches will close every single week. What about the spiritual health of the church? When we see the church's defenses, as it were, crumbling, when we see the church's offense almost non-existent, is our heart dislocated? Are we touched? Are we saddened? Do we weep? Do we mourn for what God's kingdom looks like? Luke 13, verse 34, Jesus is on his way into the city of Jerusalem. And in Luke 14, verse 34, he looks down, 13 verse 34, he looks down, and this is what he says. Luke 13 verse 34, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather you, or excuse me, gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Jesus is approaching Jerusalem because he is approaching his crucifixion. It is right around the corner. And where is his heart? It's not on the suffering he's about to go through. It's on the people. He's got a dislocated heart for God's people, his people. And he weeps because they won't come to him. He's not the only one. In Romans chapter 9, Paul reveals his heart too. In Romans chapter 9, I'm talking about his people again, of Paul says this, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. Where is your heart? Paul looked around and his heart was broken. He said, I would even trade my salvation if it was possible for my people, God's people, to be saved. What makes your heart sick? You may think to yourself, it's not really that important, is it, Todd? Oh, yes, it's important because Jesus tells us, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Or in other words, those things that you value the most are those things that have your heart. And it is extremely important for us to identify whether our hearts are focused on us or focused on others. In the middle of the third century, there was a Christian leader by the name of Lawrence. 
He served as a deacon of the Church of Rome. And according to tradition, Lawrence was in charge of not only holy things like uh, communion chalices and candlesticks, but also the church's treasury and what we would call the benevolence fund. In Lawrence's day, public opinion about the church had turned sour. Uh, they were not very happy about people who followed Christ. And so one day, the ruler of the city came to Lawrence, and, and, he, and, he, uh, and he said to him, Gather the wealth and bring it to me. The wealth of the church I want you to bring to me, Lawrence. Lawrence took his message, and he returned with a message of his own. And this was what Lawrence said. He says, I do not deny that our church is rich and that no one in this world is richer, not even the emperor. I will bring forth all the precious things that belong to Christ if only you will give me a little time to gather everything together. So the ruler asked for all the wealth of the church and Lawrence agrees to give it to him. The ruler is sitting back and he thinks about all he's going to do with the money and the gold and the silver that he receives from Lawrence. And for three days, Lawrence ran about the city collecting all the church's treasures. The problem is they were not the sort of treasures that this greedy ruler was dreaming of. And instead, Lawrence walked through all the alleys and squares of Rome and gathered the church's, church's real treasure the poor and the disabled, the blind and the homeless and the lepers. He wrote down their names and lined them up at the entrance of the church. And only then did he seek out the ruler to bring him to the church. These are the treasures of Christ's church, he said. Then Lawrence declared as he presented this raggedy crowd to this astonished ruler, he said, their bodies may not be beautiful, but within these vessels of clay, they bear all the treasure of divine grace. When you look at the church, what do you see? Do you see vessels of divine grace? Or do you see someone down the a pew that, that once said something mean to you? Someone who, who, who did something that offended you? The guy who, who didn't shake your hand when you came into church and you're upset by them? Do you see vessels of grace? Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? The greatest command, the commands that sum up everything for the church is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. Is that where your heart is? See, having holy ambition, living up to God's design for our life, accomplishing the unimaginable for God all starts with a heart that is dislocated. A heart that has moved into action for other people. And Nehemiah had that heart. Do you? Do I? We could stop the sermon there, but I didn't want to do that. I think it's important that we understand how to develop a dislocated heart. Now before we talk about how to develop a dislocated heart, I, I want to be very honest with you. A dislocated heart does not come naturally to us. In fact, the natural heart is to tend to focus on self. So you've got to realize, if you want a dislocated heart, it's really going to take work and, and effort and, and discipline to, to, to receive it and to continue to, to nurture it. So, so it, if you want a dislocated heart, listen further. If you're satisfied with where you are, I guess you don't have to listen anymore. But, but here are the steps. The first step to a dislocated heart is that you have to want it enough to pray for it. You have to want it enough to pray for it. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is looking out. He sees all these people who are helpless, who are struggling, who are, are just in a bad way. And when he looks at them, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38, this is what it says. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, I want you to listen. He looks out the crowd. He sees these helpless people, these people that are struggling in life. And he says to his disciples this. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus looks at these people, and he sees need all around them. And then he looks at his disciples, and he says, do you see the need too? 
Can't you see it? It's everywhere. Look at all these people that are struggling. He says, that's the need. Then he challenges the disciples to ask God to send out harvesters into the field. Now, the problem is lots of times we take that verse and we think to ourselves what he's saying is pray that people will go to people who haven't heard about Jesus and tell them the good news. That's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But what Jesus is really telling the disciples is go. Pray that God will send you, that you will accept his call, and you will go out. And you will reach out to a helpless and hurting world. If you want a dislocated heart, it's going to start by you wanting it enough to pray that God will give you an opportunity to love someone. Isaiah stands before the Lord. He realized just how weak he is, sinful he is. The Lord cleanses his lips and then he says, I've got a mission. I need someone to go on. And what does Isaiah say? Isaiah says, here I am, Lord. Send Me, how many here are willing to say the same thing? Here I am, Lord, send me. I have a dislocated heart for people. Send me, send me. Which leads right into the second step, which is to take a risk and step out. I know we think we're playing it safe by not stepping it out, stepping out, but the truth is when you step out into the presence of God, walk with God, you're in the safest place you could possibly be. Sitting still is in the most critical, dangerous spot. Stepping out is the the safest place you could possibly be because you're following in the footsteps of the Lord. There's a story told. It's found in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is a story about a man who was uh, beaten up, left for dead in in a ditch, as it were. All of his friends, or at least his people, his brothers, walked right by him. In fact, the religious leaders of the day walked right by him, could care less that he was in the ditch. But along came his enemy, a Samaritan. I want to read what he did. Luke chapter 10, 33 and 34. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The Samaritan came along and saw a need. And he didn't just see a need of a person, but he saw a need of a person who was his very enemy. And this Samaritan, he didn't just see the need, but he got off the donkey, stepped into the ditch, and ministered to this man. He acted on that need. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and not only cared for his needs, but paid for his needs to be cared longer. Cared on and on and on until the man was well. See, here's the point. The challenge of this scripture to me is that we're supposed to do the same. We're supposed to ask God to give us a dislocated heart and then risk everything to act upon that dislocated heart. I know sometimes we think that God is asking us to do something that is so hard to do, but it's something that he was willing to do himself. If you go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Philippians chapter 2 Verses 5 through 8, it says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. In other words, you need to do what Jesus did. And then he goes on, he says, Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Have you ever thought of all that Jesus left behind? The glories of heaven? Being able to be in direct presence with his Father, with God the Father? Experiencing the untold joy of angelic praise? He left all of those things. Why would he leave all of that? Why would he humble himself and become like one of us? And not just become like one of us, but serve us and die for us? He did that because he had a dislocated heart. He was moved by our plight. And he acted on our behalf. That's our call. That is our call too, to have a dislocated heart. Our call is to have a dislocated heart. Our call is to follow Jesus. Our call is to sacrifice for others. Our call is to hurt because others are hurt and make a difference when we can in their life. The only question is, will we accept it or not? Will you pray with me?
And then, Father, I come to you this morning to be quite honest with a broken heart. I don't even have to look out beyond myself to have this broken heart because I recognize just how often I've been selfish in my ambition instead of holy with my ambition. Lord, I pray for myself and for each one here that we will desire a dislocated heart. To be quite honest, it's not optional. It's what you called us to be. People who have love other people, who put their needs before our own, who feel their pain, who hurt when they hurt, who mourn when they mourn. People who pray and act because our hearts have been touched. Lord, I pray for each one here that their heart will be touched by the peril that our world is in. I pray for each one here that their heart will be touched by the position that the church is in. Lord, thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you for his dislocated heart. I pray each of us will have one too. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation. I'm going to ask you all to stand if you would. If you're a Christian here this morning, as we sing, Oh, how he loves you and me. And then it says he gave his life. What more could he give? If you're a Christian here this morning, know that you've been called to do the same. I think sometimes we've accepted the gift that Jesus gave us. His life. But we haven't accepted the call that Jesus called us to, and that is to give our life to. If you're a Christian here this morning, I would encourage you to think about your life and ask God to give you a dislocated heart. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord. Maybe you want to be obedient to Him and give your life to Him. Now's the time to come. Now's the time to confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. Now's the time to repent and recognize that you can't do it on your own, but you need Him, and His ways are the right ways. Now's the time to come and be immersed where you participate in his death and burial and resurrection. Where the Bible says you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and a new life. Now's the time to start your walk where you not only give yourself to him, but you give yourself to others. With a loving, dislocated heart. If you need to make a decision, won't you come forward as we sing?